Hi, in this video, we will talk about different types of force. So we just introduced the force in connection with Newton's laws of motion. We talked about forces as um, being a push or pull. That's a good starting place. Um, uh, really, force is most uh, basically understood as a push or pull. And what I think will now help us to get a solid grasp on these types of push or pull is to go through a comprehensive and exhaustive list of forces that you will see in this class. Going through this list will especially be helpful as you work through the Newton's Law problem-solving strategy. The first step in that problem-solving strategy is drawing a free body diagram and knowing the complete list of forces that could be in that diagram is helpful in one, making sure that you include all the forces and two, making sure that you don't include anything that's not a force. So let me point out each of the forces that you will see in this class. And maybe I'll say something brief and unique about each force. Okay, so let's get started with the normal force. It's the first of the forces listed as uh, common forces. And with the normal force, there's a quite a bit of detail that you can get into, which your textbook does. It describes how when you place an object on the table, the table sags a little bit. And normal force is produced with the sagging deformation up until when this normal force is equal to 8. It's good to have that mechanism in mind. And really with the normal force, the most important thing to understand is that it's the contact force that's a perpendicular to the surface. So when I put my hands together, it, there's a reason my right hand doesn't go through my left hand. And the reason is the normal force produced by the surface of my right hand. So that's normal force. You will see it in quite a few contexts. In some situations, we ignore its existence. And in other situations, we make sure we include this force in our analysis. The types of situations where we have to make sure that we include normal force will often involve a friction force, which your textbook covers in the next chapter. So we'll talk a little bit more about friction force in a couple weeks. And for the time being, I guess what's uh, important for me to say is that the direction of friction force is parallel or tangent to the surface. So when you think about contact forces, so forces that are produced when two things touch, there are two types of forces we talk about. There's the force that will be perpendicular to the surface. That's the normal force. And there's a force that will be parallel to the surface. That's the friction force. Between these two, they cover all the contact forces that occur between two surfaces. And we also, bring in a couple more contact forces. They are covered in chapter five under common forces. And although they are somewhat related to each other, I think it's important that we treat them as separate. So the, the first of those uh, remaining contact forces that your textbook will mention is the tension force. So uh, tension force is, as your textbook says, it's a pulling force that acts along a stretched flexible connector or a rope or cable or string or, or sometimes maybe even spring. Although spring force is the second force that we will treat separately. If you think through materially how a rope exerts a tension force, the way it works is quite similar to a spring force. So as you pull on the rope, the rope stretches a little bit. And as it's stretching, it pulls back on the thing that's pulling. That's the tension force. In terms of problem solving in this class, I think the most important thing to remember about tension force is it um, keeps the two things that are connected by string at the same distance and the amount of tension force is whatever it needs to be so that that distance remains the same. Up until the point where the string is no longer taut and it goes slack. And this is what the textbook is getting at with you can't push your rope. 
tension force can work only one way. It resists the pulling and it doesn't resist the pushing. That's the job of the normal force. Spring force is something that we'll spend more time in coming weeks, especially as we talk about work and energy. And for the time being, I guess it's enough for me to mention Hooke's law that relates the magnitude of spring force to the displacement, how much the spring is either stretched or compressed. And we'll talk more about spring force later on in the semester, so we will um, leave that there. Okay, I think that covers all the contact forces that you will see in this class. And this is the great thing about contact forces. In order to exert contact force, two things must be touching. Either two surfaces are touching, so there's a normal force and or friction force between these two surfaces. Or there's a string attached and the string is taut, so there's a tension force or there's a spring attached and there will be a spring force. These four forces that I mentioned, you can't have any of these forces acting without there being some kind of contact. So it limits what kind of things you look out for. And even some other forces that we won't really deal with much, like air resistance or sometimes called air drag, uh, those are also a type of contact force. It's a, like a friction force. Air resistance only acts when air is touching the object. Now, we do have forces that act at a distance. And for the purpose of this class, we will really have only one force that acts at a distance. And that is gravitational force. We bring it in chapter five as a weight, uh, which is, for, as far as this class is concerned, it's another word we use for gravitational force. And for a great portion of this semester, we'll treat gravitational force in a relatively simple way. We introduce this quantity called gravitational acceleration, or maybe less confusingly, uh, strength of gravitational field, and given this quantity g, the gravitational force is given by mass times that gravitational field. And this description is perfectly fine as long as you are near the surface of Earth. <laughs> now, when you are farther away, maybe you are in orbit, maybe you are, uh, maybe we are talking about interaction of astronomical bodies in a solar system. Then at some point, we do need to bring in Newton's law of universal gravitation. That's in chapter 13. And I think it will be um, useful to bring this in after we've talked about all the other mechanical aspects, um, things like energy, momentum, angular momentum. So we'll hold off on this uh, longer description of uh, gravity. And for the purpose of this class, gravity, will be the sole and only force that can act without touching. Now, if you know a little bit about physics, then that's not quite right in the real world. We have electric force and magnetic force, but those are the subject of physics 4b. So um, unless we explicitly mention them, you can assume that we are not going to deal with the electric or magnetic force. So I think this uh, listing of forces will help help limit the number of forces that you will need to consider. You know that as you draw a free body diagram, all the forces that you might be drawing on a free body diagram, they will either have to come from something that's touching the object, or it'll have to be gravity if it's coming from something that's not touching the object. So let me summarize. This is the comprehensive list of different types of force in physics 4A. We have the normal force, we have friction force, we have tension force, we have spring force, and finally, we have gravity. Oh, I said I would uh, point out a unique thing about each force. So the thing about normal force is it prevents uh, sinking or digging in of an object into surface.
the thing about friction force is uh, it can be complicated, but it boils it down to it prevents sliding between surfaces. Tension force, which only acts when two things are connected by a flexible connector or string, it prevents uh, two things from getting farther away, moving farther away. And for spring force, um, I guess the best thing for me to say is Hooke's law. Force is proportional to the displacement by some constant, spring constant, and in the opposite direction from the displacement. Sometimes we talk about restoring force. And for gravitational force, which we'll talk about more, for now, the important thing is it's a given by mass times the strength of gravitational field or gravitational acceleration. And the important distinction to draw here is that all these forces, the first four forces that I said in blue, are contact forces. And there's only one in the list that is not a contact force. So for example, if I have an object, and right now something's touching it, so there are contact forces on this pen. If I set up situation so that nothing is touching this pen, there can really be only one force on it, which will be gravity. So if I let go so that nothing's touching it, then the only force on it is gravity, and we say it's the gravity that's accelerating it downward. Now, this isn't to say for gravity to act, nothing can be touching it. So while this is resting on my hand, gravity is still on it. Um, in this situation, gravity is pulling it down, but the normal force from my hand is also pushing it up. So they balance out and it's not accelerating. The net force is equal to zero. So that's enough of the different types of forces. I just want you to close by highlighting a couple things that are not distinct types of forces, especially in physics 4A. One is something that you will see quite soon, uh, which is called centripetal force. And people in this class might have heard a caution against centrifugal force. And what I want to caution you in addition to that is that centripetal force is not a separate type of force. If you read through the section carefully, you will note that it says any net force causing uniform circular motion is called a centripetal force. So a centripetal force is a type of net force. It's a, a kind of subcategory of the forces that you get when you've added all the forces that's acting on a body. So and as you're trying to count up all the forces acting on a body, you don't count the centripetal force as its own separate force because centripetal force is what you might get after adding everything together. It's not one of the ingredients that go in. And the thing about the centrifugal force, it has to do with the inertial reference system. And I think it's the best to discuss the, in discussion of Newton's first law. And I will just leave it here, which is that uh, in this class, we will always work with the inertial reference system. So any pseudo forces or fictitious forces that arise from the acceleration of reference frame, uh, we won't deal with them. There's a lengthier reason I should give why it's good for us not to deal with the centrifugal force, but this video is already long. So <laughs> I'll hold off the discussion until later. So until next time, bye.